For the News and Observer, I'm Dawn Vaughn, Capitol Bureau Chief and host of Under the Dome. You're listening to this episode for the week of August 28th, 2023. After about 20 years of progress, North Carolina Freedom Park opened this past week in downtown Raleigh between the executive mansion and the legislative building with a ceremony attended by hundreds of people from the governor, all of the park board members, the community, and, and other guests. So my two guests today are Senator Natalie Murdoch, a Durham Democrat who's been in a role um, in the park before yep. I think you were even in Absolutely. the state senate, yep. and uh, uh, historian and professor Reginald Hildebrand, who's a board member and um, several other things. So tell us a little bit about um, your uh, your career and, and history and, and how you ended up on the board. I am a retired professor of Afro-American studies and history, and I've taught at uh, Williams College in Massachusetts. Uh, the longest stretch of my career was at UNC Chapel Hill. And after retiring from there, I taught for three years at Durham Tech. Now I'm just retired. <laughs> So how did you? How long have you been involved with the Freedom Park project? How did that come together? Uh, it uh, about twenty years, maybe a little longer than that. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Diane Pledger, asked me to come to one of the com- town meetings they had at Durham, and the next thing I knew, I was part of the board, and then I was uh, chair of the site selection committee, and then I became co-chair of the project itself, uh, and uh, now I am a a member of the board. Okay, and Senator Murdoch, how did you yes. become involved with it? Yes, um, I've been reflecting on so much of this this week. Mm. Honestly, everything happens for a reason, and it's all about timing. At the time, I was actually Deputy Communications Director for Attorney General Josh Stein. I was working full-time on the Deborah Ross for U.S. Senate campaign. We unfortunately didn't win, and so I was at the Department of Justice, and at the time, Valerie Jordan, who's now on the DOT board, mm-hmm. was a new member on the Freedom Park, and she said they're looking for a campaign coordinator. You've expressed the interest in looking into consulting opportunities. What do you think? And um, so kept thinking about it. Ironically, um, literally fell into a corporate contract around the same time. Um, so when I finalized those two opportunities, I actually left the Department of Justice to start consulting full time. Um, so the North Carolina Freedom Park was actually my first contract. But in interviewing for the role, what I've learned is I love being a part of legacy projects. As you know, I have a deep background in transportation, um, worked on the Durham Orange Light Rail project, um, highways, roads, bridges, you name it. And there's just something about being a part of something that's bigger than yourself that will outlast you, that when you're long gone, it will still be here. And it wasn't until the Freedom Park that I realized um, I'm personally connected to projects that are legacy projects. And being a North Carolina native, born and raised, have shared with you, can trace my roots to North Carolina, to slavery, to Orange County. And so literally did it for my ancestors. It was just something that I was honored to be a part of, couldn't turn it down. So from 2017 to 2021, 2022 was a huge part of my life and can't believe that we opened the park um, just just this week. So um, humbling experience to be a part of. Just just in passing, Senator Murdoch, I'm proud to say is my senator. Yes. I live in Durham. <laughs> And uh, her coming on board was a great plus for this project, moving it forward when she did. So let's talk about the location. If you, um, anyone who um, works maybe in the state government complex or goes to the legislative building and and as comes on, um, comes that direction to the legislative building from the mansion or from from Oakwood, that's one side of, of the park entrance. It's behind state archives and records, but it's, pretty much was tucked away. It was a gravel parking lot. There was this weird concrete gazebo structure that um, was built in the 70s. And it was just basically surface parking and a lot of um, a lot of trees that are still there. Um, The victims memorial in one little part with a garden. And then a long time ago, it was, um, you know, a house was there Mm -hmm. and it was owned by someone who enslaved people, you know, two about 200 years ago or mm-hmm. so. Um, but how did that land, I mean, I guess the state already owned the land. So was that part of it, like looking at how, um, what state-owned land isn't being used that could turn into something like this? Do you, um, yeah, how, how was the location one. picked? We had great help uh, from um, Jeff Crow and Mike Hill and state government and the Department of uh, Natural and Cultural Resources, the state archives uh, and history departments. 
who walked us through a number of sites to see what was possible. Uh, this one symbolically was just so important. It was state land that was leased to us for the purpose of building this park with the understanding that when it was completed it would revert to uh, state uh, ownership. Uh, the symbolism of it being uh, across the street from the legislature where history is made and next to the archives where history is recorded mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just uh, behind, just across the street from uh, the governor's mansion makes it such a prominent and central place symbolically uh, that uh, there that uh, people coming out of any of those buildings will see the beacon of freedom and hopefully hear the voices of freedom inscribed on those walls. Mm -hmm. And I think Governor Cooper really nailed it in his remarks of just that connection that it makes. I mean, uh, to be a part of the project for around five years and to be a legislator and to walk in and out of that building during the mm -hmm. construction, you just felt the significance of it being in that spot. Mm -hmm. And just that connection when, quite frankly, you know, more divided than we've ever been, and for the Freedom Park to hopefully be a bridge, you know, between the Governor's Mansion and the General Assembly to say, let's acknowledge this history that literally took place on those grounds and just hats off to the vision, because I can't tell you how many times we're working on the project and we let them know where it's gonna be, and honestly, folks didn't get it. But now that it's open and they walk through it, they're like, oh, this is the perfect place for it because it was very uh, unassuming and you know folks parked there if they worked at cultural resources but now we see truly how underutilized it was and how it's literally going to change the look and feel of that entire government complex. I, I was there uh, last evening. It's hard for me to get away from that place from about 8 o'clock until about 8.30 yeah. uh, just to see what was going on and there was never a time when it was empty. There were people walking through it, some people walking their dogs, people coming through, but they were also thoughtfully looking at the quotes. There's sort of, it, it, when it's lit and the beacons illuminated uh, in the evening, there's this, this sort of a soft, uh, almost glow to the feeling, the ambiance as you're walking through there. Mm -hmm. I uh, saw a couple coming up, uh, a young black woman had on a shirt that said uh, we can do it mm. standing next to the beacon and it just struck me this is this is the message we were trying to get yes. across it just and many people of different backgrounds were just there seeing it taking it in respectfully thoughtfully yes. what do you see it as being you mentioned legacy mm -hmm. 10 years from now 20 years from now um, as as what it's going to be a, a gathering place of just i guess part of just what downtown is. It's kind of the first of several changes that are going to come. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, natural sciences, which everyone I think knows her, if you say like the giant globe, mm -hmm. that side, mm -hmm. it's going to have the um, dinosaur lab on the street. So that'll be a draw. Department of Administration is, it'll probably be in the budget, more money to bring that building down mm -hmm. and then build mm -hmm. an education campus. So all of mm -hmm. the state employees, they're, what they see and where they work is going to change. But also the potential draw with the students that come, yes. to, um, both to the museums. Because you can see from the History Museum, if you're coming out to the um, parking lot in front of Cultural Resources, you can see Freedom Park right there, or on mm -hmm. the edge of the legislative building. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that as being a, a field trip destination? I know you had talked to the, the high school students yes, that toured it under day. construction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we definitely see it as being a, a huge draw. It's something that's always been a part of the concept for the project for the entire 20 years. And again, North Carolina native, um, you know, someone who remembers those field trips you take to the state capitol. <laughs> and we believed in having all of our history reflected, you know, as you know, a young black kid growing up here in North Carolina, they should see something that feels and looks like them um, in our state's capital, but, but for everyone. Uh, I, I was um, really emotional, quite frankly, when you see the diversity of who's already coming to the park, because when we did the renderings, Dr. Hildebrand will remember this, we wanted, um, you know, folks in wheelchairs, we wanted, mm -hmm. you know, young people, mm -hmm. older people, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what you saw. You saw a little mm -hmm. bit of everything. And particularly for those school children, no matter what your background is, you should know of all the folks that contributed to our state and particularly utilizing the quotes instead of just a physical bust. Um, people get it. Uh, you know, 
folks are already citing a lot of those quotes because those words and ideas live on long after those individuals have passed. It's really what they said. Let's talk more about the quotes when we come back. We're going to take a quick break and we'll talk a little bit longer with uh, Dr. Hildebrand, Senator Murdoch about Freedom Park, about the monument that hasn't gone up yet a couple blocks away <laughs> and our picks for Headliner of the Week. We'll be right back. You're listening to Under the Dome. I'm Capitol Bureau Chief Don Bond here with historian and Sea Freedom Park board member Reginald Hildebrand, State Senator Natalie Murdoch, a Durham Democrat. Before the break, we were talking about some about the legacy of Freedom Park and how it comes together and wanted to ask you all about the quotations that are there. And everyone there is a North Carolinian, either born here, spent time here. And how did you decide who those, those, 20, those 20 voices would be? It was a very difficult uh, and rigorous uh, process. Um, and technically, uh, there is one uh, a journalist, Robert Hamilton, who is an uh, editor of a black newspaper from New York who was visiting North Carolina and made comments about black North Carolinians. So he's not uh, North Carolinian. Uh, and there is a soldier, John W. Pratt, who was from Maryland, but he was with the regiment coming through Wilmington making observations about North Carolina. And so they're all people who have some important North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina connection, not necessarily North Carolinians. The points of the, the quotes and the character of the quotes, Don, are, are um, key to the message and meaning of the park. And I'll give you one example, the quote uh, from Abraham Galloway says, I'm looking for the rising generation, the foundation must be laid. A good friend of mine, Dave uh, Denard at uh, East Carolina, and David Soselski, who wrote the, bio the biography of Abraham Galloway, we asked them not for a quote that would sort of demonstrate the heroic character of Abraham Galloway, although that's important, and we want people to know that as well, but we asked them, what if Galloway was in that park, talking to people coming through, what would be on his mind? And that, what they said, I thought it was brilliant. He'd be saying, I'm looking for the rising generation. So young people coming in think that those quotes are speaking directly to them to inspire them. And all of those quotes are of that nature. They come from specific historical circumstances, come out of a very specific black experience, but they speak to the human condition. And they aren't just reflecting on a historical event. Each of those quotes is speaking directly to the person reading them, no matter what their background is about mm -hmm. some essential part of freedom or the struggle for freedom. Mm -hmm. One that you mentioned, um, history, I guess the most recent quote was George Floyd, right? Yes, Senator Murdoch, we're going to see how we came about yes, that. Yes, yes, and <laughs> um, we, we have got to unpack this now that it's finally done because uh, that was actually under wraps for a while and, and mm -hmm. just wanted folks to see it when it was revealed. And um, full disclosure, I am, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatic, pragmatic progressive, but as liberal and progressive as they come. And I actually had to think about that. As a board, we had to talk about it. We had to deliberate it because we knew that it was that watershed moment. I actually believe it was a member of um, the Perkins and Will team was the first to actually say, hey, maybe you know we should include this. And you oh, would think. And we hadn't mentioned yet that uh, Perkins oh. and Will, which is Phil, late Phil, Phil Freeline, right? it was the architect. Absolutely. So um, I, since that happened after Mr. Freeline passed, it was a member of his team that said with his ties to North Carolina you know should we should we do this and um, you know noodled on it you know as a as a board and I, I think the more that we thought about it we wanted it to be quotes that you know will outlive one specific moment and we were concerned about is this just you know, kind of one flash in the pan. But I think the more that we thought about it, um, and particularly for me being a millennial, I felt that that was the, the, the moment of our time, particularly when I say young people, I mean elementary, middle school will remember where they were when they saw the video of George Floyd being murdered, remember the pain in his voice, the angst in his voice, and how in the midst of a pandemic, it rallied people to say, we've got to do something about police brutality. So the more that we thought about it, it, it really was a no brainer, but I can't stress enough, it wasn't an obvious decision for us. We really, really had to think about 
is it something that really should be, you know, etched in these stones to outlive all of us? And the answer was yes. And I and I saw it um, when you looked at folks that are already coming to the park. I was struck particularly by young black teenagers that are males to say mm -hmm. they stood there and looked to say, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that this is a, a part of the park and, um, you know, situated prominently you know you see it as you as you enter the park because i think it's also unfortunately sobering because it's a moment that showed us how much farther we have to go um which connects to another quote of you know the battle for freedom begins every morning because you you don't just achieve freedom and you're done you're constantly fighting for it and i think i can't breathe as a, a true example of how it's always a fight it's always a struggle even though the african-american story is one of the most American that you can have, which is why we have the Freedom Park. Um, but it, it was a reminder of we have so much farther to go. And we also, it, it rounded out the park to me because so many of the quotes are from folks that, um, you know, from 1800s, 1900s, civil rights era. And this is our modern mm -hmm. civil rights time. I, I think there's so many parallels to the 1960s when you look at what we were dealing with with those years of fighting against police brutality. So I thought it was a nice way to round out what the park will mean. And, and there was a, a group of young women yes. that had commended us to us and yes. made sure that we thought about it. <laughs> yes, yes. And to your point, um, it was during, gosh, was this 2021, the one year anniversary of the death of George Floyd, they gathered at the, the Freedom Park space, even though it wasn't open, gathered there with family members of Mr. Floyd at the park um, to say that they annually want to do an event there to, to commemorate him before we even agreed to have that quote there. I'm going to make a couple of quick points, just yes. piggybacking on what the senator has, has mentioned. Um, that the that quote serves as a counterpoint. Its, its placement is largely due to my friend Reggie Hodges, who wanted it to be clearly outward prominent when people come into the park. Uh, but the poet laureate of, of the state, Jackie Shelton Green, wrote a poem mm -hmm. uh, about the beacon of freedom called Freedom's Beacon, beautiful poem uh, commissioned just for the park. Uh, but it serves the purpose for the beacon uh, that the Emma Lazarus poem does for the Statue of Liberty. Send me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And our counterpoint from George Floyd is, I can't breathe. Uh, his uncle, Roger Floyd, uh, during the opening was sitting by that quote on the wow. bench there. Mm -hmm. There were three cousins of Julius Chambers who gathered around his quote. Uh, those, these were meanings that I hadn't fully anticipated what these things might mean to family members, mm -hmm. but all of that is, is going on there. Uh, we were talking about George, George Floyd, and it was that summer of, of protests um, that were across the country. It was 2020, I think, 2020. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and in North Carolina, too, and it was when protesters took down some of the Confederate statues on the Capitol grounds. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, listeners, uh, the North Carolina state law that passed under McCrory doesn't allow you to relocate Confederate statues or others unless it's to a similar prominent place, unless there's a safety hazard, that sort of thing. So what happened is protesters took down some of the um, Confederate soldier statues on the, on the Capitol grounds, and then Cooper's administration removed the others mm. under the, the mm. basis of the law of saying it's safety because of all these, all these protests and everything else. So around that same time, there was plans for a completely separate project um, on the Capitol grounds for an African-American monument that they hadn't totally decided what it would be. I believe it was like the, the Heritage Commission had spent decades on going through what this, they already knew the corner it would be on, the southeast corner, and, and what it might look like. And it, I think it would be like these low walls, and they weren't sure if there would actually be statues or something like that. So that was in the 2019 budget that never never became the law. The budget that never was. And then it came in different, like how uh, there was an amendment once in the Senate that had money for both Freedom Park and the African-American Monument on the Capitol grounds. Mm -hmm. And in the end, Freedom Park got funding. Of course, it also had a lot of private funding. Mm -hmm. um, and the Capitol grounds monument does not. Um, yes. But that might happen this budget. It was in the Senate's version of the budget, but we'll see if it ends up in the final budget. So. It was at least in the Senate budget. Uh, I worked closely alongside um, Secretary for our 
North Carolina Legislative Act Caucus have been on the executive board even since I was a freshman. And as soon as we saw it in the budget, uh, Senator Robinson actually saw it before I did. She said, the Capitol Grounds monuments are, are in the Senate budget. But to your point, in 2019 and, and before I even joined the, the Freedom Park, we always viewed them as, you know, sister projects as mm -hmm. the Freedom Park has a place, the monuments on Capitol Grounds have a place, but we still have to continue to bring it up because I think particularly with the Freedom Park and, and the protests that were sparked during um, or after the tragic murder of George Floyd, we had a lot of conversations of what we don't want to see in our public square, but we also have to have conversations of what do you want to see? And I think the Freedom Park was uniquely positioned because as Dr. Hildebrand just mentioned, particularly with the uh, being in a freedom that light, something positive, uplifting. I think so many times when we talk about African-American history, it's, you know, the, the the bad stuff. And yes, there's a lot of it, but the, the Freedom Park bridge, both of that together. Um, but the same with the monuments on Capitol grounds, we deserve multiple spaces. It doesn't have to be just one thing. More than thrilled and will always be thankful to my colleagues, highlighted that on my social media. Yes, Freedom Park was truly bipartisan. If it were not for Senator Kathy Harrington, mm. uh, Representative Jason Sane, mm. leadership mm. in the House and the Senate, I can go on and on. Um, but we have to finish what we started. And we, we still have to address the monuments on, on Capitol grounds because you you have to tell all of our, our history, you know, especially in a state like North Carolina, one of the first states uh, that was even founded, you know, here in the in the U.S. So we we can't just ignore that by saying we did this one thing, we're done. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think it's a model of how to do it the right way and, and more and more spaces like this are needed across the entire state. I, I would add that this is, we've always seen these as complementary projects. And I, can, I think I, can, I know I can speak for the board saying we are enthusiastically in support of uh, the other project with uh, statues as completing uh, the project that we set out uh, mm -hmm. to begin on. We, what, our project conceptually is different. The monument for Freedom Park are words and ideas. That doesn't mean there isn't a place and a need for statues. We see that, we recognize that, and we support that. Mm -hmm. okay. And and also, as you laid out, I remember it like it was yesterday, because it was 2020, it's COVID, we're still having session, and we're so thrilled that the Freedom Park finally made it in the budget. You were there, I had to recuse myself from voting on that mini budget, because I said, wait a minute, this is my client. I recused myself, but was still thrilled. And um, as it started working through the House after the protest, that is when we saw the funding removed from Monuments for Capital Grounds. And it, it, it was a gut punch, honestly, you know, because we always view them as complementary projects where both of them were needed in the heart of our state's capital. Well, we'll see you while we wait on the budget. We're about out of time, so if we want to go through <laughs> our uh, our picks for headliner of the week, I'll, I'll go first and then turn it over to you both. Mine, as you're listening to this on August 28th, it's the first day of the traditional school calendar. Um, my son is a high school sophomore, and there was the Meet the Teacher open house this past week at his high school, and there's a new principal and they did the Q&A. And a lot of people had questions about, well, what about this and that? And, you know, your own kid. But then at the end, uh, this one parent asked the principal, how are you? How are you doing? What do you need? And you hear a lot of the stress that uh, teachers and, mm. and administrators, and obviously, of course, students and families and everything are under too. But I thought that was... Um, that was a nice moment that um, that a parent recognized the support for the administrator. And her response was, you know, you could just see that she really needed that to start the week. So um, my headliner of the week is all of those, um, all our um, school employees and um, all the kids and everyone starting off and hope um, hope their buses show up and uh, there's enough drivers and all of that, all of that works out. So that, that's my headliner. Uh, Dr. Hildebrand, um, what, uh, who or what is your headliner of the week? Uh, the uh, recent announcement by uh, a Supreme Court Justice Michael Moore that he will be stepping down, uh, which may lead to uh, great changes on the court as well, possibly uh, may um, some changes in the lineup for the gubernatorial election. This is uh, August 28th, uh, and this is the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, uh, and having, we've talked about this great use of public space at Freedom Park is. Uh, the, Mar the Lincoln Memorial, which does not mention the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, we, in a sense, are doing something they did not do by putting the focus on freedom, but 
Both of those spaces indicate that the meaning of that public space comes in part from what people bring to it, what happens there. So um, Martin Luther King, in effect, rededicated that space and gave it a meaning it didn't have initially. Uh, and we're hoping that will happen many times with Freedom Park. All right. And uh, if Justice Morgan gets in for governor or for, um, I've heard, uh, you know, other council of state positions, if he ends up doing that, it'll, it'll be, um, you know, a little more interesting campaign season. We'll see. As far as the <laughs> primary, <laughs> Republican gubernatorial primary is uh, going to be pretty active. We'll see what, what happens on the on the Democratic yeah. side. Uh, all Definitely. right. Senator Murdoch, uh, what's your headline? Like? Yes. As, as a member of the Education Committee in the Senate, have to stick with education. Uh, I started my week Monday and Tuesday with the Hunt Institute, attended the DPS convocation. Um, it's the way that you have convocations at the collegiate level, we do it in Durham and we get all the staff together, all the teachers, feel Durham Stadium to have a big pep rally to get excited about the school year. And um, But it was sobering. Um, so many parents, teachers, students, when are we going to get a budget? Budget. Um, so I cannot imagine being a superintendent, a principal, a teacher coming into the school year, not really knowing what you're planning for. And it's just time for us to figure it out. You know, we, we really, really have to get a budget. We rushed back um, to do some overrides just last Wednesday. But we, we really, really have to allow our schools and our counties, our county commissioners were there to, to plan and to, to get a budget to give our students what they need to have a successful school year. Reporters are waiting on the budget, too, so <laughs> I think everybody is. So well. Got to do it. Got to do it. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Hildebrand, Sarah Murdoch, for, for being here. I'm Don Vaughn for the News and Observer. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.